Welcome everyone. I want to welcome you to the fourth installment of the Path to Carbon Neutrality's webinar series hosted by the Office of Sustainability. My name is Tina Wilson and I'm the director of the office. Next month we will have another installment, um, hopefully related to global sustainability. But in this webinar, Andrea Wolfel, the plant operations manager at Tufts, will be discussing Tufts Central Energy Plant, otherwise known as the CEP, and its role conserving resources on campus. We're also joined today by Darius Reskowski, the Director of Engineering in the Facilities Department, who will be also helping Andrea converse about these topics. Additionally, we're joined today by Charo Vijay, an intern in our office and an eco rep, and Jen Riley, the communications specialist in the Office of Sustainability, who are providing technical support for this webinar. Thank you both for being here today. To start us off, um, Andrea and Darius were wondering what kind of information and questions the audience has coming into today's webinar. If you have something in mind that you want to know, please place it in the chat now, and they will try to address that in their presentation or afterwards. So now I'd like to introduce our speakers, Andrea, um, they, who uses they, them pronouns, has her BS in Marine Engineering and Mechanical Engineering from the Massachusetts Maritime Academy and a MS in Facilities Management. After working at sea for around six years as a US Coast Guard licensed engineer, she returned to work on land as a plant engineer and acquired her Massachusetts stationary first class engineer license. She has worked on my, uh, many sustainability projects in the past at CoGen, which is co-generation, which she'll talk about, and aims to bridge the gap between utilities, engineering, and facilities operations to optimize efficiencies and help Tufts realize its sustainability goals as a leader in campus energy systems. Additionally, I'm going to introduce Darius at this time so he can jump in at any time and add to the conversation. Yeah, um, Darius is currently serving as the Director of Engineering at Tufts. In the past, he has worked on projects such as installing solar panels on the roof of Lewis Hall. Um, and I know many, many other things. He's a very busy, busy man. As a member, um, with over 10 years of experience in construction and management, he plays a big role in ensuring our campus energy systems through the central energy plant. making sure it's running an environmentally friendly manner. All right, welcome you guys. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would you like me to start now? <laughs> yeah. Excellent, thank you very much, Tina. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, give me one second here. All right, can you all see my screen? So this is uh, the installment to the Path uh, to Carbon Neutrality webinar series and it's energy efficiency and the central energy plant, also known as the CEP. Um, give me one second, it's not advancing my slides. There we are, we've already been introduced. Uh, uh, Darius and myself, Andrea, and um, like Tina said, I run the plant for Tufts. I joined just recently in June of this last year, and I'm very excited to see what I can do here on the campus. So when we talk about the CEP, uh, it's really important to talk about where we were here at Tufts University. Um, you probably have seen it around the campus if you're here, but the central heating plant uh, used to be the only thing that supplied steam for the upper campus of Tufts. There are some smaller steam generating plants on the lower campus, but on the Medford side, the central heating plant was the thing. So it was built in the 1950s. Um, due to that, it was quite outdated. Um, there were some updates made in the 80s. Um, the plant is also a bit of an eyesore. Uh, it was originally built uh, burning oil. So always fossil fuels, originally oil, there were some updates, we started burning oil and gas, uh, but it was pretty clear that the plant itself needed to be upgraded or replaced. Uh, it had a very, very high de deferred maintenance investment need. Um, also was it was producing only steam and consuming an awful lot of power. And, and the campus itself was, was provided electricity through the local utility grid only and that infrastructure was, be, was, was starting to decay. It was getting outdated. It was becoming, uh, it was becoming 
a bit of a problem with outages and the outages on both thermal and electrical side were getting longer, um, putting a, a heavy burden on the facilities team and just becoming an issue overall. There were some additional drivers too. Not only did the plant need to be either upgraded or replaced, but the campus was expanding and there was some need for um, some more utilities. So in order to respond to that issue, uh, in 2013, right around there, uh, an energy master plan was starting to be developed for the campus. And uh, it was very forward thinking, thinking about what to do and what the challenges were. Um, they identified some plans and did some feasibility studies and found that a cogeneration plant and or a central chilled water plant were uh, opportunities here on the campus. Um, and the decision was made after all the feasibility studies and, uh, and seeing that there was a return of investment of you know, around a decade that they were going to invest in this project to put in a cogen plant. So this, this project, this is a picture of the plant, if you haven't seen it, it's pretty noticeable on Boston Ave. Um, you can see the cost there around 51 million and it was, it was completed just a few years ago, 2018, and has been online since in a process of you know, commissioning and getting everything going. But what was installed there is some very state-of-the-art equipment, obviously better than what was the 1950s technology. Um, but the main pieces of equipment in here are a Caterpillar four megawatt natural gas fired reciprocating engine, which has um, steam generation integral to it and hot water distribution integral, which I will talk about more in detail later. Um, also installed were three high efficiency boilers for backup and two high efficiency chillers. One of those actually using heat to make chilled water, which is just magic in my opinion. Um, this is the, the efficiency of all of the units here uh, basically increased the efficiency of, of producing steam from about 25% in the old plant to as high as 85% in the new plant, um, which is pretty significant when you talk about energy conservation and, and driving towards the right direction for sustainability. Um, we have the ability to self-generate now and um, that self-generation, at least for the time being, is produces much less carbon than importing power from the local grid. Again, more things I'll talk about later, but this is just the uh, introduction to what our uh, CEP is. We've introduced resiliency, reliability by having our own microgrid, which is what we are. Uh, so let's go talk about some of that. So I've said uh, cogen, we've also say CEP, we say CHP, these are all uh, terms I might use um, intermittently there. Combined heat and power is a CHP plant. And um, these plants have been on the rise since um, early 2000s. They really started putting these in around, um, around the Northeast. Um, a setting like Tufts, an academic campus, is a perfect candidate for a CHP. The difference, the main difference, is that it's combined, right? So an old power plant or an old heating plant like we had takes fuel puts it into a boiler or an engine of some sort and you're getting one utility out of it. So you can see in this graphic, fuel's going in and, and we were here just getting heat. The rest was going to loss up the smokestack. With the new plant, with the combined heat and power plant, you're using one fuel source to get multiple utilities, hence the term co-generation. Uh, some people, you could even call us tri-generation here for what we do at the Tufts uh, CEP. So we're using one fuel, which is natural gas. And from that, we're getting electricity, we're getting heat in two forms, and we're getting cooling off of that also. So we're driving those losses down to uh, less than 10%. And you can see on this graphic here, this is just a, a, a representation of, of what a combined heat and power CHP plant would, would, would be doing. Um, in general, CHPs, uh, you see them more on the Northeast because to make a CHP a successful uh, project, what you really have to have is a congested area, a place that has multiple buildings and a smaller, uh, small footprint, like, like an academic campus or a hospital manufacturing complex, um, cities like Cambridge. Um, you need to have a thermal and electrical demand in that same um, place. 
Um, and, and it's really important that you're able to harmonize both thermal and electrical profiles to make this work. You also need to have pretty expensive electricity prices in the area, which you know we have in the Northeast. And you also have to have access, easy access to fuel and water and other resources. Um, so the Northeast is a perfect fit and these combined heat and power plants uh, are, there, there's actually a lot of them in this area. Um, you see, um, you see them all around here. There's uh, MIT, Princeton, Harvard. There's a few major biopharmaceutical uh, companies that have these, as well as uh, Boston and Cambridge has a very large cogen plant. Um, these technologies are the way of the future, and they just keep getting better and better. And you know, with 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 the added users and the user groups that we have we're all helping each other um, to make sustainability more profitable through these models. Um, one, uh, there's a part of the IDEA District Energy, the International District Energy Association. They have this video here. I'm just gonna play if I can figure out how to do it. And uh, it's just a nice little snippet on, um, on just a little bit more about what, district energy is. So give me one second and I will cue that up. Oh, hopefully it works. There is an urgent need to renew our energy infrastructure, especially the mission critical grids and piping networks serving our cities, communities, and campuses. District energy systems are a key component of this infrastructure renewal effort, providing heating, cooling, and power through underground networks to nearby customer buildings. Aggregating the energy needs of dozens or even hundreds of buildings creates valuable economies of scale for lower carbon sources like combined heat and power, geothermal, recovered heat from data centers or sewers, or renewable cooling from a lake or ocean. Many communities already rely on district energy to cut carbon emissions, enhance resiliency, and support high quality jobs all while protecting against the risks of extreme weather or an overburdened power grid. Investing in district energy infrastructure is a reliable, resilient, and efficient option. A practical, time-tested solution to our pressing energy and climate challenges. For more information, visit districtenergy.org today. Massachusetts homeowners, if you have a power meter like this on the side of your... Sorry about that, folks. <laughs> From the state of Massachusetts, oh up to a. Give me one sec. I cannot make this stuff. <laughs> Technical difficulties. I run a power plant, not a computer very well. All right, let's get back into it. Here we are. All right. Thanks for bearing with me. So. The key to that district energy or combined heat and power for a, a, a network like ours is that when it is more profitable, those profits just in turn be reinvested into more renewable technologies and enhancements. So it's just, it's a win-win situation. And, uh, and what we have here as a microgrid gives us that much more flexibility. So a microgrid, if I use that, I don't think I've used that term yet, or maybe it was in one of the earlier slides. A microgrid, like Tufts has, is, is an electrical independent decentralized electrical generator, um, but we are in parallel with the local utility grid. So we have the ability to import power, export power, or completely isolate from the local grid and run what we call island mode, which means we are independent. So if there's some disaster on the local grid, we can, we can disconnect from it and run on our own. Um, so that is uh, pretty much the definition of a microgrid. But what is the, the way of the future are these new sophisticated smart microgrids. Um, and, and that's an, uh, gives us this diversity. So this energy diversity that enables us to look towards our path to carbon neutrality in stages. Um, and we can ensure while we're doing that, that the campus has what it needs and, and keeps us you know, nimble and able to change and adapt and add. 
um, you did mention that Darius has been a champion for some of the projects like solar panels. We have five solar arrays uh, on the campus right now that are attached to our microgrid. So they feed into the same network where we're generating power onto. Um, we also have another one planned uh, in the athletics uh, district. So by doing that, having this diversity of energy into our grid, we're setting a foundation to dispatch and generate with the cleanest sources we have available. So that might be from the grids blend, which is improving you know, year over year, or it could be through our self-generation and our solar. We're also exploring uh, sophisticated battery storage solutions in the near future. And that could help us with either peak shaving or marginal emissions corrections, so that we'll be able to choose what source is, is the cleanest um, and the most profitable also. Um, in addition, you know, to, to get to our carbon neutrality goals, we're fulfilling the commitments in other ways with virtual power purchase agreements and other modernization. Um, so the global community is changing the way that we view the energy market and it is trending towards this smarter dispatch methodology. And we're working with partners so that we can stay ahead of this curve and, um, and dispatch responsibly. Um, right now, our self-generation is typically cleaner than importing power from the local grid. Um, there's different you know, schools of thought on that on how to determine you know, the carbon weighting of the, of the energy that's out there on the market. But on the whole right now, um, our self-generation um, will save us in, in our, reduce our emissions for the greenhouse gas inventory. Um, so if we, we've positioned ourselves to be able to adapt and move forward. Uh, let's see, next slide. So you might recognize this. This is the map of the campus. Um, so the cogen, the cogen has been online for about five years now, a little bit over. And you can see that orangey with a star right there, that little box on Boston Ave, that is the CEP. Um, so not exactly central, but it is the central energy plant. So all of the buildings that are in any color at all on this map, those are being supplied electricity through the CEP, whether we're generating ourselves or importing it, we're distributing it from the CEP to all of these buildings. Um, the yellow buildings, that is our, our thermal network in the form of low pressure steam coming out of the plant. Um, we also have hydronic hot water, which I will talk about uh, in a couple slides here. And right now that is just being supplied to the Tisch library, um, with, uh, but we have plans for that water as well. And chilled water is going to those four buildings you see with the star, that's uh, Dana Barnum, Olin, Tisch Library and the SEC. Now the SEC was a huge driver for that because they have quite, uh, quite the chilled water demand over there. Um, so all of our electricity that we distribute out is at 13,800 volts. So if we, are, we are still in the process of modernizing our electrical grid, uh, but uh, all of these utilities, they, they run underground and uh, we're working on modernization, like I said, and, and enhancing that. Um, we still have some buildings down on the Somerville side that have um, smaller steam or hot water plants, um, but we have future plans on those as well. So when I was talking about the old plant, um, I've blurred out the back. It's not your eyes, don't worry about it. There are three boilers that you see on this screen and that's pretty much a representation of all we had here in the old central heating plant. We had traditional boilers, we put fuel in them, we got steam out and send it to the campus. With the new plant, um, you can see there's quite a few more colors and arrows and, and uh, equipment. Um, the engine, you see this the cute little cat graphic there, that is, the, that is the reg. So that is taking natural gas in a reciprocating engine, similar to uh, you know, your standard diesel engine, but this is burning just natural gas. So this reciprocating engine um, is producing up to four megawatts of power, uh, depending on our dispatch. And from that one engine, we've got a very delicate heat balance that comes from there. So this delicate, sophisticated heat balance, we've got the one fuel going in, 
and we've got the electricity coming out. Uh, but what we have here is that the jacket water that actually cools that engine, right? So the heat from this engine in jacket water gets transferred to another loop of hydronic hot water. And that hot water is what we're distributing out right now to the library with future expansion plans on that. So that hot water loop not only is being sent out as a, as a, as a thermal utility, it's also cooling the jacket water to be sent back into the engine on a continuous basis, you know, to cool all of the engine needs, like lube oil and the, you know, the engine. You don't need to know all the specifics. Um, but the other way we're using waste heat is the actual heat from the combustion in that engine. Instead of going up to a traditional smokestack where it's all lost from the generation of electricity, all that heat is now funneled through a series of water tubes in a heat recovery steam generator. So all of that heat from the exhaust is now transferred into water and that water is, is producing the steam. So you've got steam coming out of the HERSIG, the heat recovery steam generator. Um, and then we've got the boilers to supplement that. So your campus um, electrically can be anywhere from two megawatts to eight megawatts on demand. And for the steam side, it could be anywhere from four or 5,000 pounds per hour of low pressure steam to as high as 30,000 pounds per hour. And that steam is being used for hot water, heat process, humidification, all kinds of needs in the campus. So, so you can see, I know there's a lot of lines and colors going everywhere, but what, what you've got here is just a process that is, is highly sophisticated and it's the best available technology right now to take all of the BTUs, all of the heat that can be produced from that one fuel source and using it to the best of our ability. So this is something, you know, going forward in the future, when they designed this CHP, very important thing to keep in mind was where we could go and how we can expand and how we continue to optimize. So the focus right now is, is in BTUs and where we can pull therms out and put them other places in the campus. Um, so that is the heat balance. Uh, what we have here, um, these are graphics also taken from the, the building automation system here on, on the Tufts campus that the facilities operations team and operation controls runs. Uh, this is, this is a, a graphic that shows our electrical distribution. Um, prior to this upgrade, the electrical distribution was, was an aging infrastructure here. So part of the cogen, part of putting in the CEP was upgrading some of the electric utilities. So right now, all of the breakers you see below the dashed blue line, um, those are, that's where all the power is inside the CEP. So we're generating, either we're taking it in from the utility or generating ourselves, or we're distributing it through here, through some very sophisticated automated uh, computer controls. Um, we have redundant electric service. Uh, I don't know if it's kind of hard to see from the drawing. It's very familiar to me, but we've got two utility feeders coming from National Grid local at 24,000 uh, volts. And then it's knocked down to work in parallel with us with redundant feeders. So if there's any kind of problem on the grid, we can also, we can swap or we can, or we can you know, split the load. There's all kinds of options here and it all can happen on an automated basis. So we've got, um, as the microgrid that we are, if we feel like there's something wrong with the grid or, or, or you know, there's bad weather coming in, we can dispatch accordingly and make sure that we're in, in the best position to be resilient and be reliable for the campus so that we minimize unplanned outages. And if there is an outage, that the mean time to recovery is as short as possible. Um, we have the ability to go island as well. And with, this automated uh, scheme, it's a protection too. So within a fraction of a second, we can protect ourselves from anything on the grid that, that we don't like, like uh, you know, lightning strikes or whatnot. Um, so this resiliency and reliability in the combination with you know, local building level emergency generation and UPS gives the campus its most robust, robust access to continual power. Um, we also have the ability, like I said, as a microgrid to be island. So the system can automatically shed buildings that are lower priority to keep everything we need running. Um, in order to, to, to realize our goals, we have to make profit. You know, we can't have, no one wants to put a plant in it. Someone's got to pay for it. Uh, so we have a partner, uh, called Ice Tech, which, um, 
pretty much virtualizes what we have in the CEP. And this is the really cool stuff that I've been really enjoying learning over my last seven or eight months here. Um, so we work to predict what the market is gonna do. So with IceTech, we're able to, to realize better profits by making ourselves available for different programs through the state. Um, whether it be forward capacity market or, or, or spending reserves, things that keep us ready to help the grid in case they have some instability and they need us to respond, um, you know, economic dispatch. We also have the ability um, to save ourselves some money on, on fees by pe uh, peak load shaving uh, during those high demand days in the middle of the summer, which also just helps the greater community because if we can lower our demand when there's a, a possibility of a, a complete local brownout or blackout, it, it helps everybody if we can lower our demand and run so that um, we're able to keep the local grid up. Um, those efficiencies um, save us money, like I was saying, and they, and they, they just enhance the local grid. Um, we were talking about a little bit earlier about dispatch to also promote good greenhouse gas emissions uh, responsibility about that. And, 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 and ice tech also, it, we're working with them to start develop, develop more of a carbon rating for us that we could be real time with the market and produce the cleanest power um, to help ourselves and to help the local grid. Um, so I think, uh, I think I've pretty much talked that out. As far as carbon emissions, this is a very conservative number, but just so you can see a little bit of the changes from, from what we had to what we have now. Uh, all the way to the left is um, a snapshot of a year in um, tons, metric tons of carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas. Um, so that is in just producing steam with the old central heating plant. And then in the middle in the blue with a little strip of yellow, is a, a representative year of the CEP. Now these numbers are a bit older. We're actually more efficient and continue to get more efficient as we add load and make changes in the plant. Um, but this was a representative year and we kind of extrapolated out those numbers to an equivalency on the right side. So if we still had that old C central heating plant and we were able to get what we got out of the CEP, the equivalency, equivalency would be about 22% more uh, production of uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so it's just a nice little graphic to, so you can see that. And, and, and along with the graphics, that's about 3,500 metric tons that we saved by running the CEP. And again, it's a very conservative number. I'm sure it, it is higher and it you know, depends on a lot of math, but this is just a nice graphic representation of what that looks like, 3,500 metric tons. Um, it's a pretty nifty little greenhouse gas calculator that the EPA has available to everybody. Um, so. All right, I think I'm doing okay on time, right? Uh, so almost done. Uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about where we're gonna go. So with the CEP, we've got um, some opportunities to expand and, and optimize our operations. So we are actively looking at multiple projects across the campus uh, to increase our distribution of our hot water, hydronic hot water and chilled water from the CEP. Every time we add load to the plant, it actually helps with our efficiencies because there's, there's often a lot of um, therms or BTUs left on the table. That, that right now we might have to remove by using our own chilled water. But if we can put it out into the, into the campus, it's just gonna increase our efficiencies. Overall, our efficiency is probably around 65 to 75%. And I think we can see uh, some big increases as we add more load. So we're looking to extend that hot water. Um, there's possibilities of, of moving from steam to hot water for the entire campus uh, so that buildings can take only what they need and we don't have those line losses in, in pressure reduction. Uh, we've, also, we've also been working with the capital renewal and the construction folks, uh, which is great getting utilities in at the beginning of projects so that we can, we can all approach it with a sustainability mindset and leverage what we have to create an achievable pathway, pathway towards greener solutions. 
So that, that responsibility from the macro level to make those decisions and set the foundations for uh, conservation and dispatch is one thing. Um, and we're also paying attention to what our colleagues are doing and, and going to these events like Darius is at this week um, to grow together as a community and info share and try to get the, the best possible solutions. Um, and we also, besides the large scale, we're getting into the weeds of things a little bit here. Um, I know I am personally. Um, I have, like I said, I am new here, um, but what I see myself, like uh, Tina said in my introduction, that I, I see myself as a bridge and I'm a bridge between engineering and utilities and facilities operations on the ground and I'm very excited to learn about the buildings in your campuses is beautiful. It's got a lot of old buildings and got a lot of new buildings. Uh, so I am looking forward to getting to know all of these systems and working intimately with the facility zone managers to create a benchmarking program for setting goals for the building core utilities so that we can um, we can really start setting goals for optimization, retro commissioning, and just overall decrease our energy usage intensity, the EUI, for each building and, um, and really just improving on the whole. So what I see here on the campus moving forward is the CEP playing a huge part in the conservation of, of uh, resources and energy across the campus and, um, and really creating that centralized utility provider which will you know, give the campus uh, more of a chance to expand in a more sustainable manner and to connect other systems to us and give us that redundancy and, um, and flexibility so that there's less downtime, uh, lower overhead and just a, a good solution for the future. Um, pretty much all I have, I, uh, I hope uh, I can answer any questions that you all might have. But my email address is there and you can find me in the Tufts directory. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to Tina. And uh, there we go. Excellent. Um, and so that's all I have for you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk about CEP. Great, thank you so much. This was really fun. Um, I had a couple questions while I wait for some other folks to ask questions. Can you explain what peak load shaving is? Uh, well, it depends if you're what we're talking about as peak load sh shaving. What I see it as, uh, it's a it's definitely driven by money for me from, from what I'm looking at with um, resiliency coming in along with that. But for peak load shaving, during those hot high demand days in the summer, the energy prices can, can just exponentially just right through the roof, it's insane. And, and the demand on the local utility starts to, to, to get real tenuous, right? So when we're doing peak load shaving, if you were on campus this summer, I was trying to institute a new program working with the OCC and the facilities people. Um, to take buildings that were maybe not occupied to full or not even in use at all, um, and to change some of our HVAC by a few degrees so that we could actually just lower the total amount of energy we're consuming at that high demand time so that we're giving the grid a little bit more breathing room and we're also saving a bit of money because these peak demand days also set uh, penalties for us, for our pricing structure in our utility bills. So um, kind of how I see peak load shaving, Darius might have a, a more technical definition for that, but for what I see it, it, it helps us help the grid. So basically you're, when there's a lot of energy being demanded by the rest of the people in the, in the area, um, that's the, that's the, energy electricity load and so you're trying to like just take a little off the top of what we're asking yeah. for right yeah, just save a little bit off yeah just save a little bit off. And, and and as we're able to expand and and hopefully uh introduce new technologies like like battery storage that that those sort of technologies will help will help us with that so we can take less in from the grid and produce it ourselves when we want to right so if we had a gigantic battery during a 
Darius might be talking about this. Oh, but oh perfect, he, Darius. He, he was you, ready. He was I think ready. peak load shaving is really cool. So you wanna you wanna use your diagram? It's awesome. I think Andrea covered it. I, I have a choppy uh, signal, so if I break in, I apologize. But we we follow our campus electrical load, so we try to generate what we need for ourselves. And then there is a peak that we hit that we have uh, penalties that we pay for. So we try to avoid those penalties, but we also support the grid. So sometimes while we are being asked to reduce our load, we have to produce electricity onto the grid because there's insufficient generators. All these retirements of all these large power facilities that used to burn coal and oil, there's not enough of them on the grid anymore. So the grid is at risk. So we get paid to produce electricity. So we have a choice to reduce our loads in all of our buildings and have as much ample capacity to throw that remaining balance of power onto the grid, or we just reduce our loads and do damage control for ourselves. But it is a, a grid resiliency move that is um, incentivized by the utilities to ensure that it remains online during these peak days. Yeah, so uh, I understood from you, Darius, in the past that our central energy plant is really helpful to the grid operators because it can turn on and off relatively quickly, correct? It is a, a fast responding asset. So we are very fortunate to be called upon frequently and participate in these programs. It, typically, most institutions will do this one time uh, a year. And we typically get called on every couple of days. So, what are the what's a slow responding um, power plant? Um, there are large reciprocating uh, pieces of equipment, rotating pieces of equipment like turbines, and they take a long time for them to start spinning up. Where this immediately starts, there's reciprocating parts like a diesel engine or your car that are basically blasting back and forth, and they'll start up just right. You start up your car, where these other pieces of equipment, they really need time to spin up the speed and actually generate that electricity property. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, now for the magic, Andrea, this is always a fun one to explain. How does, how do you get cooling out of steam? Well, it, it is, I like to just draw a box and just put heat in, magic, cold out, but. That's what um, I do. <laughs> it, it, it usually explains it. Um, so at the CEP, we have a, it uses hot water as the generating medium. A lot of, me, uh, medium. A lot of places do use steam. My, my, my former uh, plant, we had two steam absorption chillers. So this is a, a heat absorption chiller. So basically you're using um, available safe minerals like lithium bromide as a solution. And we're using heat as basically the pump. So we're using, um, it changes in, in temperature and changes in vacuum to pull these the heat through to cause evaporation. And when you evaporate, you, you take you take the heat out of something, right? So it, it's just changing the flashpoint by using a different different chemistry and a different uh, pressure. So you're using heat basically as the motive force through that equipment, and we're making chilled water off of that. Is that cool. It's magic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much magic. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the most challenging thing about your job? Hmm, probably can't say that. <laughs> Darius, isn't it? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's not Darius, that's for sure. Um, about this job, like here at Tufts? Yeah, like running a, a, a running a central power plant. Like what's uh, okay. the most that's, challenging that's probably thing a better question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, it's really just the things you don't know. So the unpredictability is the is is the most challenging thing. <laughs> look, look at him. <laughs> Darius is ready. See, magic. We um we, we can include that in the follow up email since it takes I it takes a little while to look at it. Um, oh, I and love figure it. out how it works. Uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite websites. And I spent a bunch of time staring at this like a a, a while ago. It's a uh, it's cool. It's <laughs> <laughs> He's having too much fun. Um, I think, yeah, I think it, the challenges are those unknowns. So machinery is machinery uh, and you can do preventative maintenance. You can have reliability centered maintenance and, and asset management and be ready for everything, but you just don't know when it's gonna break. And especially with a high, high automation plant like this is a, a very, very technologically savvy plant. It's run by computers and computers sometimes glitch. And that I think is the biggest challenge is, 
is the computer side. So I know what to do, you know, if a valve leaks or a pump breaks down or a motor burns out, that's very easy for me to fix. I can, you know, I can rebuild a pump, no problem. But um, when the computer side, when the computer side fails, sometimes it takes a bit of digging and, and you just have to make sure you have the right players and have the right network of, of vendors and contractors that, that you trust and you know that you can, you can get on that really fast. But you know, the only way is, is, is through setting the right foundation. You know? So if you know it's something that could break at any time, you, you get a second one of it and it's ready. So okay. you know, having spare parts, it really, it's, that's the challenge is that organization and being ready for it and trying to anticipate the craziest things happening, which is fun. That is cool. Um, what would happen if the grid power went down? What would happen to Tufts? Well, what would happen to Tufts? It's happened a few times. The grid has taken us down a couple times, like on the 20th, and I apologize, it really wasn't our fault. Um, when the grid goes down, so we have um, on our main breaker, so there are two main breakers that take the power in from the utility. And we have these very complex computers that are controlling in the background of each of those breakers. They're called um, protective relays. So they're actually looking at both sides, our power, their power, and within a split second, it's actually within cycles, if it detects a problem, we hope it's, it's acting fast enough. Not so fast that it's a nuisance, but fast enough that we can be disconnected from them as fast as possible. So these protective relays will see that the utility has gone down typically and will open us up. And that's when I said we can go island mode, this is what happens. So that breaker will open up and the, the machinery on our switch gear if the load is higher than what we can produce at four megawatts, it's gonna selectively shed you know, two or three buildings and lower our load so that our generator can stay online and power the campus. And it is even so sophisticated that the brain of the switch gear can calculate the load we're making and continuously compare it to what we are generating and add buildings as needed. So this is, a, this is a something we're actually working on right now to you know, it's a continuous process to evaluate, you know, is it working? What do we have to change? Did something change in one of your campus buildings making that one more important than the one next to it? So for us, if we see the grid go down, we wanna be island, we wanna isolate from the grid and continue to supply power. Most of the time, it's a, it's a very short interruption in the grid power and you don't see it. Uh, we'll disconnect from one of the feeders of the utility make sure it's stable and reconnect to the other feeder. And that happens automatically within a matter of uh, seconds. Wait, what? can you explain that more? Are they both from the same grid? How does They're that work? They're both from the same grid. Unfortunately, that, you know, we, we are only connected to one utility grid, but wouldn't that be nice to have a different supplier? They got a bit of a monopoly on that one. Um, but yeah, so we have two redundant feeders. They're not 100% redundant right now as they, as they were constructed, but um, for what they do for us now, they are redundant. So if there's an instantaneous problem, we'll isolate from it and connect to the other. Um, so that would have to be an instant a problem somewhere relatively local, right? In order. Yeah. So, so the grid that we're on is uh, Wellington Station, which is not that far away. Um, and they've probably got, I'm not actually sure how many do they have about a dozen customers probably on that 24,000 volt line. Darius may be more familiar with that. Um, but uh, most of the times when we feel a problem, it's with somebody else. It's usually a cable supplying some other large facility or town. Uh, and maybe it's a car has hit a pole and, and a fault current has gone back to their station and we felt it. Uh, and, you know, electricity is kind of nasty like that. The fault current can be quite high in this area. So then if you're switching to the other um one is that off of a different station like not it's off of the same station but often the Im immediate disruption that happened clears a breaker somewhere else so like just in your house like if you stick a fork in your in your wall right. out, it, it's going to pop your breaker it you know it could take out your whole house sometimes it happens when it's big enough but what you're hoping for is that wherever that problem was that fault cleared and that the power is stable again after that second of a, a disruption. So that's what we're counting on with the utility. And we've been forcing them. I know Darius has been working with uh, a lot of 
colleagues and um, you know partnering with with other end users like us who are uh, microgrid to put pressure on the local utilities to be like hey you guys have a responsibility to clean up your power you know we're doing the best we can here but if you send us bad power that's not okay because there's not really been anyone holding them accountable oh interesting uh, so we are actually quite powerful. The more we have decentralized microgrids like this, we can put pressure on the grid and in turn, it makes it better for everybody. Oh, that's great. So um, Darius, what's the top thing you want students to know about the CEP? I think Andrea covered it very well. It is the bridge to the future. So there's so much technology that is still in development and we have created different pathways and networks to allow us to plug and play and appropriately retire these major investments the university has made. So if we bring new fuel sources to the university, they have the ability to be injected into different pieces of equipment, or we retire these pieces of equipment with their end of life. So there's a fine balance between the financial investments, their life expectancies, and what's available in the market. So I would say that the second important thing is we actually want the students to engage in the discussions with the plant team because we need your help. We need help understanding whether our carbon accounting needs to evolve. We need folks to study marginal emissions and tell us why they're more valuable to use as the not only carbon accounting, but the economic driver of how we potentially dispatch our plant in the future. We currently dispatch it for revenue purposes. It's purely economic. If carbon becomes a taxable item, should we be using marginal emission? So I would leave that project on the to-do list for folks that are looking for projects to do to help the uh, operations team understand how to evolve the process knowledge and the machine learning that's on top of this plant that's looking at all of these different metrics to operate in the most optimal fashion. So I think efficiency is carbon reduction. And we are trying to maximize that on a daily basis. Andrea is finding low hanging fruit on a daily basis with different things that the operators are working on through good maintenance and the coordination with all those other departments that you heard about. Um, we also need help understanding is steam something that should be retired? Is hot water really the right way to go? Or is steam really something that should be fed by hydrogen fuels? So, I will tell you that being at a conference where we have some of the most sophisticated institutions that are working on fusion power, that even those don't layer hard enough the true impact that oil and gas have by 2050. So the retirement of fossil fuels, while it may be something that says you should electrify your campus and that's your only option, it's not a reality. It is not practical. You, you saw the video. There are three different uh, utility streams because the utility can't give us enough power. So we want to plug in all these electric vehicles everywhere. Guess where the power is still coming from? The dirty plants. So there's a lot of balance needed here to understand the different market opportunities. So it's financially smart for the university to get greener, but also understand that we're not retiring things because they failed to support sustainability. We're doing it in a smart way that allows us to plug infrastructure in that is just the stepping stone. And there's always something bigger and better out there that's going to be um, practiced that we don't wanna be a guinea pig on either. And all of this information that the student population, all the different academics are modeling and studying right now are helping us also understand, can we improve our heat balance? Can we improve how heat exchangers work? Can we use different metallurgy? Can we use different chemical engineering? Does water chemistry make sense? At MIT, they're capturing water off the cooling towers to reclaim it and put it back into their process to reduce water consumption. So it's not just energy focus, it's also water focused, storm, sewer, wastewater, things like that. But that, that's what I would say is the biggest, you know, glamour shot we wanna make about CP. It is the bridge to the future. It is the smart thing for the university to do. I know that there's divestment from fossil fuels that is, you know, lingering in the background. And I want folks to know that that is part of the strategy to retire the fuel assets and convert to these greener fuels. But they need to be here to keep the doors open to the university so we can still do our core business. So sustainability is not just carbon. It is trying to also be resilient and balance all of these things at the same time. Great. Um, on that water uh, point, 
Andrea, do you know how much water, or can you share with us how much water the CEP used? I don't know that off the top of my head, no. <laughs> it's a lot though, right? It's a lot, it is. It is a significant amount of water, yes. Um, I mean, just in what we have to add to the system as lost water, it can be it can be upwards of 20 to 40,000 gallons a day. So in the, in, it, it depends on the season and what we're doing. I mean, cooling towers, they use a lot of water. There's a lot, you know, there's, you know, there's, you, you lose some to evaporation, but there's just a lot of um, you know, buildup of dirt and minerals in there that need to be blown down. So, um, I mean, there are ways we're trying to attack that right now at when um, you probably have noticed there are some leaks in the systems around the campus. There's, you know, you, you see you see vapor clouds um, from our system and we're working on that. We've got, you know, plans to, to make repairs and to find where everything's going and to increase how much we get back of our steam and condensate. So we're not adding more water to our loops. Um, but like Darius was saying, part of that is trying to find different different um, technologies. So if we can use more hot water uh, or get more, uh, get more load out there. So we're not, we're not dumping and, and having to add more water for cooling and whatnot. You know, that's almost got out of without a dog barking. That was so close. Um, uh, but the water usage, it's not, it's not, it, it's not great, but it's um, you, they were using a lot of water to just make steam before too. Um, but like Darius is saying, I know in my in my previous plant, we, you know, that's just the low hanging fruit we're talking about. These are the things I'm looking for. Um, in my time there, I was, you know, I was the chief of that plant for about 10 years and we reduced our water by about 30 to 40 percent by finding ways to reclaim water. And it was off of like high purity reverse osmosis skids, definitely all of all of the HVAC coils. We were taking water off of all of them before I left and trying to reuse wastewater streams for, for other uses for cooling and whatnot. So, you know, I see, uh, I see a lot of opportunity here and a lot of room for improvement um, because you guys are still new to the utility game. So this is very exciting. That is exciting. I could talk to you guys all afternoon, but I will just ask one last question. Um, so it sounds like from what you're saying that in this, the whole energy field here, there's a ton of different majors, like students who major in different things. So you have, com I assume, computer science, electrical engineering, of course, mechanical engineering, um, chemical engineering, I would mm -hmm. imagine, for all the chemistry in there. Um, what other, what other majors would go into kind of working on this, a plant like this? We still got a lot of business and, um, you know, oh and uh like economics major dynamics and actually science i know i yeah, there's a lot there's a lot to it i know um pretty soon i'll be working with um the thermodynamics teacher um ace i don't know her, her last name but we're going to be trying to partner with some of those students in the thermodynamics right in there because there is so much that happens in a plant and there's a diverse background of people who end up in these these power plants uh, i know i came from marine engineering but i've worked with um a lot of operators that came from different backgrounds, like electrical, chemical. I even had a biologist. Just, you know, you just, there's there's so much that you can bring to it because of how sophisticated these systems are. But I think you, you've kind of, you covered a lot of it, but the sustainability uh, and environmental stewardship part portion of it, there's, there's a lot of room for that in this industry too. Awesome, well, thank you. Thank you both so much. This was really interesting. Um, and let's see. Next month, we do not have, um, I, I lost my, my little thing. Well, next, next month, we don't have our um, webinar scheduled yet, but we are, wanna coincide with the Tufts Global Month or Global Tufts Month by examining how global carbon neutral initiatives influence um, Tufts. So um, I hope to see you then, all of the attendees and even you guys, Andrea and Darius. But um, thank you very much. And we will uh, see you all next month. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you.